Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this uh, Good Friday service coming to you from Christ Church Beaurepaire in Beaconsfield. Uh, a very warm welcome to you all on this uh, somber day that we, that we recall the crucifixion of Jesus and meditate on the cross. Uh, <clears throat> this service is a special one, as you can see from uh, the, the decor of the altar. It's completely stripped, stripped bare, uh, no ornaments, uh, no special vestments. It's because this is a kind of a, a dead day. Uh, it's a, a very somber and uh, sorrowful day. And for that reason, I want to, to make the announcements at the beginning rather than at the end, because at the end there will be no benediction and we will uh, end the service in reflective music. So I just want to remind you that uh, Easter Sunday, uh, our service is at 10 o'clock, and it's both in person and broadcast on Facebook Live. So as you're comfortable, you can either come to church uh, at 10 o'clock or uh, join us through the live broadcast. And we will be celebrating Holy Communion for the first time since Epiphany. Our service follows the order for Good Friday and is found on page 308 of the Book of Alternative Services. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the, the Lord, Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Christ the Lord became obedient unto death, even, even death on a cross. On a cross. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned in thought and word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We pray you of your mercy, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. And let us pray. Almighty God, look graciously, we pray, on this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Our first reading is taken from the book of Isaiah, chapter 52, verses 13 through uh, 53 verse 12. That's chapter 52, 13 to 53 verse 12. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall startle many nations Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them they shall see, and that which they had not heard they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity, and as one from whom others hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases. Yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice he was taken away. Who could, have, who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. 
They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death, and was numbered with the transgressor, transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, God. to God. Our psalm is Psalm 22, uh, this, which is found on page 728 of the BAS, but the words will be in front of the camera because uh, Yevgenia will chant the psalm for us. Psalm 22 in its entirety. <laughs> Be not far away, O Lord. 
Our second reading is taken from Hebrews, chapter 10, verses 16 to 25. Hebrews 10, 16 to 25. This is the covenant that I will make with them after after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart and full assurance of faith, and our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be be to God.
Our Passion Gospel is from the Gospel of John, chapter 18, verses 1 through 1942. John 18, 1 through 1942. And I want to uh, preface this by, with uh, the remark that John uses the word the Jews repeatedly. And uh, we must understand that John is writing a very particular and peculiar context. And it's a different context than we live in. And that word should not be understood, the Jews, to refer to the Jewish people in general, either today or in that time. And I will address this in more depth uh, in my remarks after the gospel. Also, there will be no response uh, to the gospel. There's no uh, praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, or glory to you uh, for the Passion Gospel. <clears throat> the Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, betrayed him also knew the place, because Jesus, Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and brought him, and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, but, Jesus, but Peter was standing outside the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of the, this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogues and in the temple, where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, 
Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and at that moment the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to, to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as, that, as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So are you a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? And he said, As after he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? <clears throat> they shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged, and the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you, to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. <clears throat> Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over that, to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. 
Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. <clears throat> Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the, he of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write, The King of the Jews, but this man said, I am King of the Jews. Pilate answered, What ha I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic, tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says, They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus, where his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar, of, a jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine, wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. <clears throat> but when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had, been, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. In the name of the Holy Trinity, the source of all, the incarnate word, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Good Friday. It's a strange name for a day like this. I recall as a child being perplexed that why would we would call this horrific day Good Friday. I probably asked my parents and my Sunday school teachers, and I don't remember what the answer was. I think the Sunday school answer was, it's good because it results in the resurrection. And that's true, that without, without the crucifixion, there is no resurrection. Without death, there is no new beginning. But that doesn't take away from the fact that the day itself is horrible. And in fact, if you want to know the, the history of this word, it has nothing to do with good in the sense that we use it today, as in, you know, having a good time, what a good day, you know, as in nice. 
uh, it actually, in older English, good also meant holy. Like we say the good book for the Bible. It's not about being good, but it's holy. So this is Holy Friday. Uh, and in, in other languages, they have different names for this day. Like in French, it's Vendredi Saint, so Holy, Holy Friday. But really, it's not, it, this day is not in any way, shape or form, is it good. It's in fact, it's, it's condensed uh, human evil. Because you have, here we have an innocent man, and not just an innocent man in the sense of being uh, not a criminal, but a, 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 a good man, and according to our Christian faith, sinless man, who is, who is killed, executed, in the most torturous and horrific way at the hands of an oppressive state and according to the Gospels involved with you know, religious corruption and the indifference of the greater populace and, and ultimately the absence of his followers. They all scatter. Uh, this is the epitome of human Evil. There's no, you know, you know, complicated natural evil. Oh, is this a disease or a natural disaster? This is all human evil. This is all done at the hands of human beings. They're fully humans are fully responsible for the death of Jesus. But unfortunately, the horror of Good Friday didn't end on that that day two thousand something years ago less than 2,000 years ago, but a long time ago. One would hope that with the, the lesson of the execution, the murder of an innocent man, that uh, we would learn from our mistakes. But very tragically, throughout history, throughout the history of the church, throughout Western his history, Good Friday has been continued to be associated with horrific things uh, throughout the Middle Ages and even into more modern times, depending on where you're, where you're talking about. Good Friday inspired violence against Jewish people. Uh, things like, we use the word Russian, in the Russian word pogrom, but that happened throughout Europe. Uh, you know, after Good Friday services, and they hear the Gospel of John, which has its, its own challenges, people would be inspired, instead of to, to reflect on their own sinfulness, to go out and take it out on the local Jewish community, either you know, through killing people or terrorizing them, destroying their property, and whatnot. And this history of anti-Semitism is a great blight on, on the church. Uh, in, this, in a similar way that uh, uh, anti-black racism is a blight on the United States and the treatment of in, in, indigenous people is a blight on Canada. Anti-Semitism is one of the great blights on uh, the church. And even, you know, uh, uh, you know, our beloved religious leaders have been, have fell victim to this. Martin Luther is one example was known for saying anti-Semitic things. And the problem, of course, is that it, it kind of, the church has kind, of, has kind of come by it honestly when you have a text like the Gospel of John, which if you read it in your own context, it is very, uh, it sounds very anti-Jewish. Uh, because throughout John's Gospel, and this is different, you notice, that if you read the Passion in the other three Gospels, it doesn't say the Jews all the time. It doesn't say this over and over again. But John has this thing, the Jews, the Jews, the Jews, and you kind of put two and two together, and if you're a person far removed from the context in which John was writing, far removed from the context in which Jesus was actually lived, you know, you're a, a, a villager living in in medieval France or wherever, you hear 
the Jews did this, the Jews did that, i.e., the Jews killed Jesus and they're responsible. It's them, not us. It's them. Um, now, I can't go into why, uh, you know, what, what John was, was, was working with. Um, John is, uh, the Gospel of John is very special in that it's uh, quite different than the others. And it's coming out of a very intimate community, a very specific Johannine community that had a very uh, a specific history and a specific relationship with mainstream Judaism. And they had their own axe to grind. And, you know, and so there's that. And there's also the fact that, you know, we're reading this and say, you know, saying the Jews did this, the Jews did that. But you have to remember that in the Gospels, practically everyone, practically everyone is a Jew. Jesus is a Jew, Mary and Joseph are Jews, the, all the disciples are Jews, the, the, the Pharisees, the priests, the scribes, the ordinary people being healed, they're all Jews, except for the odd you know, Roman or, or, or Samaritan here and there. Uh, I mean, one, the, the only major non-Jewish figure in the Gospels is Pontius Pilate, who really is the only person who has the power of life and death over Jesus in the story. We have to, we have to remind ourselves that Jewish people did not crucify others. If you were condemned under Jewish law, you'd be stoned or you know whatever. Crucifixion was a Roman form of punishment, and it was reserved for dissidents, for people who were troublemakers, for uh, you know uh, insurrectionists, uh, for uh, you know those who would cause trouble for the the order, the established order. So all the all the characters in the story are Jews. So if you look at it that way, we're not talking about you know Christian Jesus and his good Christian followers as opposed to those evil Jews, because they're all Jews. That's we have to get that out of the way. Everyone in the story is Jews, uh, except Pontius Pilate. And John's Gospel uh, tries really hard to, to, to excuse Pontius Pilate, uh, probably more so than the other, the go other Gospels. We can ask why. Perhaps it's because uh, when you're trying to spread the gospel in the Roman Empire, uh, you know, demonizing Romans might not be the best, the best strategy. But even if you take the story at face value, Pontius Pilate supposedly saw, no, saw nothing, no guilt in Jesus, nothing wrong, no reason that he should be crucified. But he didn't stop it. He he ordered it. He's the only one who has the power to order crucifixion. So he's not a hero for sure. Um, but this whole, this whole wanting to divide ourselves from them versus us. The Jews killed Jesus. Uh, sinners killed Jesus. Bad people killed Jesus. Pontius Pilate, uh, you know, this oppressive Roman official killed Jesus. But it's, it's not us. We're, 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 we wouldn't have done that. We wouldn't have killed Jesus. We wouldn't have screamed, crucify him. Of course we wouldn't. But if we look at this, the, the whole trajectory of Holy Week, from Palm Sunday to Good Friday, there's a shift, and it's very clear in the gospel narrative, but in our minds we kind of compartmentalize these two. And on, on Palm Sunday, we're you know waving palm branches and saying, Hosanna to the King who comes in the name of the Lord, and you know, uh, praising Jesus as the people of Jerusalem did. We're on Jesus' side, of course. But God, by Good Friday, now 
uh, we've kind of got, we've tried to get away from this, and, the, and in more modern times, a lot of times when we have a reading of the Passion with a congregation in the building, we'll have people in the congregations yell, crucify him, to kind of drive the point home that it's not some other that's responsible here. But kind of the way the traditional narrative went is, we're praising Jesus on Palm Sunday, but the people who are crucifying, screaming crucify him on Good Friday, they're somebody else. Because we always want to be on the good side. And that's human nature. Every, most human beings want to be on the good side, even if they're not. Uh, you know, there are, I guess, psychopathic people who enjoy being actually evil, but most of the time this is cartoonish. This is something that you see in, in movies. It's not real life. Nine times out of ten, people who are doing evil think they're doing, the, doing something good in some way. They're acting in the right in their mind. And so, of course, we want to always be seen on the good side. But the, the, the story, as the story goes, those who are yelling, those who were crying Hosanna on Palm Sunday, they were nowhere to be found on, on Good Friday. And I'm not saying that they transformed into those screaming crucify him, but you don't hear these voices anymore. No one's, no one's speaking up. No one's, no, one's, no one's standing up against this, this injustice. So when we, we ask, who is responsible for killing Jesus? No, it's not the Jews, some you know, other group. Who, who is it? Is it, you know, who, 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 who is responsible? You have the Roman, the Roman guards who literally nailed, his, nailed him to the cross. They're directly acting, but they're just acting under orders. They're just doing their job. How many times have you heard that? Uh, you know, they're just doing their job. Pontius Pilate, he had the power to, to stop it, but he didn't. There were people in the crowds yelling, crucify him. But then there was a whole lot of people who just said nothing, who didn't speak out. I mean, even Jesus' the apostles, they scattered. His most beloved father, followers, they left. So in the final analysis, it's not that those people or that person killed Jesus. It's human beings. Humankind killed Jesus. In the same way that humankind, not acting as individuals, but acting through structures, through uh, systemic violence, systemic oppression, systemic racism, systemic anti-Semitism, and the list goes on, through oppressive structures and indifference to, uh, to the suffering of, of the weak. That this, this that kind of humanity as a whole bears the, this, this, this responsibility. That's really a really depressing uh, thought. But the good news in that is that despite all this, despite the way he died, Jesus still loves us. Each and every one of us, even the most, the, the, even those of us who think we're really bad, Jesus loves us all. And the really good news that we're not getting into today, because today, Good Friday is not, does not end with a period. The cross, the, the, the burial, is not a period in the sentence, it's an ellipsis. And I invite you to come back for the really good news on Sunday. Amen.
Our service continues with uh, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, in number 386 in common phrase. Our service continues with the solemn intercession. <clears throat> Dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved, that all who believe in him might deliver, be delivered from the power of sin and death and become heirs with him of eternal life. Let us pray for the one holy Catholic and apostolic church of Christ throughout the world for its unity in witness and service, for all bishops and other ministers and the people whom they serve, for Mary, our bishop, and all the people of this diocese, for all Christians in this community, for those about to be baptized, that the Lord will confirm his church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Almighty and everlasting God, by your Spirit, the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified. Receive our supplications and prayers, which we offer before you, for all members of your holy church, that in our vocation and ministry we may truly and devoutly serve you, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth, and for those in authority among them, for Elizabeth, our Queen, and all the royal family, for Justin Trudeau, the Prime Minister, and for the government of this country, for Francois Legault, the pr Premier of this province, and the members of the legislature, <clears throat> for all the mayors of our municipalities and those who serve them on the city councils, and for all who serve the common good, that by God's help they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Almighty God, kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace 
and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that justice and peace may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind, for the hungry and homeless, the destitute and the oppressed, and all who suffer persecution or prejudice, for the sick, the wounded, and the handicapped, <clears throat> for those in loneliness, fear, and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt, and despair, for the so sorrowful and bereaved, for prisoners and captives and those in mortal danger, that God in his mercy will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of his love and stir up in us the will and patience to minister to their needs. Gracious God, the comfort of all who so sorrow, the strength of all who suffer, hear the cry of those in misery and need. <clears throat> in their afflictions, show them your mercy, and give us, we pray, the strength to serve them. For the sake of him who suffered for us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all who have not received the gospel of Christ, for all who have not heard the words of salvation, for all who have lost their faith, for all those whose sin has made them indifferent to Christ, for all who actively oppose Christ by word or deed, for all who are enemies of the cross of Christ and persecutors of his disciples, for all who in the name of Christ have persecuted others, that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience. Merciful God, creator of the peoples of the earth and lover of souls, have compassion on all who do not know you as are you revealed in your Son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray, that there may be one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Let us commit ourselves to God and pray for the grace of a holy life, that with all who have departed this life and have died in the peace of Christ, and those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of the joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church that wonderful and sacred mystery, by the effectual working of your providence, carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down and are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection. By him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> the remainder of the service we will be meditating on the cross of Christ. I will bring a cross forward on the altar and I will remove myself from the scene as we uh, listen to the first anthem followed by the meditative hymn, Were You There? Christ our Lord became obedient unto death. Come, Come let, let us, us worship. worship. <clears throat> is it nothing to you, all you who pass by? Look and see if there is any sorrow like my sorrow, which was brought upon me, which the Lord inflicted on the day of his fierce anger. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. 
O my people, O my church, what have I done to you, or in what way have I offended you? Testify against me. I led you forth from the land of Egypt and delivered you by the waters of baptism, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. I led you through the desert forty years and fed you with manna. I brought you through tribulation and penitence and gave you my body, the bread of heaven, but you have prepared a cross for your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. What more could I have done for you that I have not done? I planted you, my chosen and fairest vineyard. I made you the branches of my vine. But when I was thirsty, you gave me vinegar to drink and pierced with a spear the side of your Savior. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. I went before you in a pillar of cloud, and you have led me to the judgment hall of Pilate. I scourged your enemies and brought you to a land of freedom, but you have scourged, mocked, and beaten me. I gave you the water of salvation from the rock, but you have given me gall and left me to thirst. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. I gave you a royal scepter and bestowed the keys of the kingdom, but you have given me a crown of thorns. I raised you on high with great power, but you have hanged me on the cross. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. My peace I gave which the world cannot give, and I washed your feet as a sign of my love. But you draw the sword to strike in my name and seek high places in my kingdom. I offered you my body and blood, but you scatter and deny and abandon me. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. I sent the spirit of truth to guide you, and you closed your hearts to the counselor. I pray that all may be as one in the Father and me, but you continue to quarrel and divide. I call you to go and bring forth fruit, but you cast lots for my clothing. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. I grafted you into the tree of my chosen Israel, and you turned on them with persecution and mass murder. I made you joint heirs with them of my covenants, but you made them scapegoats for your own guilt. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. I came to you as the least of your brothers and sisters. I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me, naked and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us.
And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Send down your abundant blessing, Lord, upon your people who have devoutly recalled the death of your Son in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection. Grant them pardon, bring them comfort. May their faith grow stronger and their eternal salvation be assured. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.